Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. You can keep your fingers back there in 1 Corinthians because we're going to turn there next. Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and do what? And take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Turn back to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians, let's look at verses 18, and then we're going to look through uh, 18 through 25. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is what? Foolishness, Foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So where is the, the wise in verse 20? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's a lot of words. Do you know what it means? Number one, God has a sense of humor. Number two, I want you to think about your own Christian experience as you deal with people in the world. And they look at you and think, how can you believe the message of the cross? How can you believe in Jesus Christ? See, because they can't understand it in its foolishness to them. But brothers and sisters, what I want you to understand is that the cross is the power of God for our salvation. Why is it foolishness to the world, but power to us? Any ideas? Say it loud. I can't hear you. I said because we believe. We believe? I like that. Think about this. When you were born, and you inherited the nature of Adam when he fell, Is your life centered around others or yourself? Self. And this is why the cross is foolishness to the world. Because the cross is totally opposite of what this selfish human nature is all about. See, because the cross doesn't just ask you, but it requires you to die. To die to yourself so that Christ can live in you, through you, with you. The world can't understand that. But you as believers know what that means. That it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. But listen, the reason why the cross is the power of God for our salvation is because we have to take Jesus at his word and take up our cross. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, take up our cross daily and follow Him. What does that actually mean as we live out our day-to-day -day lives? What does it mean to take up the cross daily? Any ideas on that one? Right? Well, we can't forget God. If we forget God for an hour, we fall. We fail. Very well said. Let me ask you a question. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus Christ? Yes. But is there something inherent inside of you that's at war with that love of God? Constantly. How do you overcome that thing that's natural to love a God that's supernatural? 
feed the right dog. <laughs> feed the right dog. Gary, you had your hand up? I was going to say, we can't do it, but the Holy Spirit can. This is why the cross is the power of salvation. Because it requires you to die. You understand? To die to self so that Christ can live in you. And we're going to get to some more texts. But let's look and continue on with 1 Corinthians. For since in the wisdom of God, this is verse 21, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, but Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ, and we preach Him crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks what? Foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Listen, did not Paul say, when I am weak, then I am strong? Brothers and sisters, this is what we have to learn through experience. That what God's Word says is true. That when I am weak, truly, He is strong. But that only works... If I understand the power of the cross and what it means to be crucified with Christ. Yes? The power of the cross shows that uh, if sin was allowed to prevail, that it would destroy God. That's what it did when Christ was put up on the cross. Mm. Mm. The cross also shows the depths of our hearts. Right? Listen, brothers and sisters, I've been reading, <laughs> been reading, trying to grasp this concept of unconscious sin, what that means, how it affects us as the remnant church. I know sin, and now to deal with unconscious sin, but what it means is, look, the hatred that was spewed out against Jesus. Let me ask you a question. What evil did Jesus ever do that would get somebody so upset that they would want to not just kill him, but crucify him? Show me from Scripture what evil he ever did. What I see in his life that is spoken of from Scripture is that he gave everything he had that last week I showed you the love of God, fall in love with Jesus Christ, and we went over the text that used the word compassion. Jesus saw the multitudes and he had compassion on them. The leper came to him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus had compassion on him. This man lived the only one to ever live a unselfish life. And what did it get them? Yeah. People hated them and they crucified them. That's what our hearts are that are unconverted. I've met people Ray, you should be able to relate to this. You've been in martial arts. you taught martial arts. Taught martial arts as well. I've had people say, oh, I, I could never do that. that. That would really hurt somebody. I've had people say, well, I I would never do what those people over there do. What you need to understand is that your heart without Jesus Christ is wicked and is evil. And you are capable of the worst atrocities that have ever been seen on this planet. This is why we need a new birth. This is why we need a new heart. This is why we need Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Amen. The foolishness of God is stronger than the wisdom of men. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the what? 
the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Um, turn to Luke chapter 14. Let's look at verse 27. Luke 14, 27. Luke 14, 27 says, And whoever does not, what? Bear. Bear his cross and come after me cannot be, what? My disciples. Who said that? Jesus. So, this term and this phrase, bearing the cross, is it important? Yes. Is it essential? Yes. It is a key to our salvation? Yes. Why? Last words there. Can what are they, right? Can you answer that? Be my disciple. So, do you understand this? You cannot live for self and live for Jesus. <laughs> it does not work. Now, brothers and sisters, what I've been hoping and trying to do is to bring to your attention the fact that God wants to come. Jesus wants to come. It's not like he's going, well, I really don't want to come there yet. I'll hold off for another hundred years. <coughs> Do you believe that Jesus wants to come? Amen. Do you believe that Jesus wants to put an end to sin? Amen. Do you believe that God does not like the suffering that this world has to deal with? Amen. So the question must be asked, why hasn't he come? Mm. Do you believe that God through the course of history, has worked in and through history so that his plan of salvation can be worked out? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that God has worked through all of history and that the Bible actually records what God would have done and what God is doing and what God will do? Yes. Do you also believe that you can trace history back and see God's hand in that? So if God has done all this work, the question is, is why hasn't he come? Do you believe that God raised up men, women, and when they couldn't do it, even children, to proclaim his truth during the Reformation? Well, that was weak. This side says yes, this side didn't say anything. Do you guys believe... That God actually raised up people to proclaim His truth when His truth was lost. Yes. Yes. Do you believe that it was God's will for the world to stay in darkness? No. no. Do you believe that it's God's will for you to have His light and His truth? Yes. So do you believe that you can trace the Reformation all the way down to the rising of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. Why are you Adventists? True. See, I used to be a Catholic... And then I heard a Protestant message, and that was based on the Bible, and I started to read the Bible, and I could see the truth of that Protestant message, and I understood what it meant to be a Protestant, that you were actually protesting something. Yes. Do you still protest today? Yes. Are you sure about that? Yes. Because that's kind of it. <laughs> that is really kind of it. Most people don't even realize why they're called Protestants. But as Adventists, you should. Because do you understand, and as time goes on, I'm going to bring you this history, God willing, of how God raised up people to bring His light out because of the great darkness that was on the face of the earth when it came to His Word, His truth, and his plan of salvation. It was not God's will for people to be lost in darkness. But God is light and it was his will to share that light. And so God raised up men who their names are still with us today. Are you still are you familiar with the Lutheran church? Who was the father of that church? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Do you believe that God used him to bring light to the world? Absolutely. What was Martin Luther's big Big idea. 
big conclusion. Out of that 95 thesis, what was his one big idea that changed the world? Righteousness by faith, right? Is that what you're going to say? I was going to say sola scriptura, which is the same thing. But what Luther came to the conclusion of is that it wasn't the church and the priesthood of the church that saved you. It was God and the righteousness that is in Christ and Christ alone that saves us. The just shall live by faith. By faith. Or by his faith. Do you know the 500 year anniversary is coming up? And do you realize that within less than a month ago, there was a thing in the internet that said that the protest is over? Yes. Oh, is it over? No. Is it over? No. Let me ask you a question. Is it Catholicism that has moved toward Protestantism? No. Or is it Protestantism that's moved toward Catholicism? Yes. So is the protest over? No. So as you look and you see history, and you see the power of the cross played out in history, and you see how God raised up these people, how these biblical truths were brought to the consciousness of the people, the people accepted them, and we keep moving towards history. Time goes on. The leaders of the church die. That church, does it continue to move forward or does it go stagnant? And God, God raises up another one. And God brings out more truth. Let me ask you a question. Do you understand the darkness and the ignorance that was prevailing in the dark ages? Do you think that the people could actually handle having one person bring all that truth that was lost at one time? Do no. so you understand truth is progressive? Yes. That God took this person, brought a truth in, would have used them if they would continue to move forward. But usually what happened is they stopped moving forward. They die out. The people <coughs> took what they brought and made a church out of that specific doctrine. And then another group would be raised up. And that, and that's why we have all these doctrines and all these denominations today. Is that what God's will was? No. That's confusion. Yeah. Right? When I became a Protestant, and I started looking at all the different Protestant denominations, I said to myself, wow, this is just, this is confusion. I was, and, and I had no idea what the Bible said at that time. But I figured that out. How can you have one book and thousands of different interpretations of it? Was God content with letting that be the status quo? No. Or did God continue to work through history? And did not God say through Scripture that there would be a specific time that something was to happen? And that a group of people would be raised up. And that God was willing to actually bring an end to all of this sin and suffering. If the people would open their hearts to him. And listen and submit. So listen, through the course of history. And through the course of the Protestant Reformation. God raised up his last day remnant church that has the faith of Jesus and keeps the commandments of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And God not only raised up what we call pioneers, but God gave to this people, to this movement, a great light. And that God used a woman in a day when women didn't have rights. But God used a woman as his channel to bring light to a dark world. And that light wasn't in addition to the Bible, but that light was pointing back to the Bible. Why? Because of spiritual darkness and ignorance. 
And brothers and sisters, we've had this movement and this life for a century and a half. Is that right? Close to it? More. Okay, more. And where are we at as God's remnant people today? We are wandering around in the wilderness, lost, looking for a shepherd. Darkness and confusion. Was this God's plan? So brothers and sisters, again, I asked you, why has Jesus not come? And you have to, at some point, ask yourself that question and start coming up with some answers. Because if you can see the answers, then we can see what we lack. Now, are you familiar with Revelation chapter 3? Okay. What is it? It's the seven letters to the seven churches. Is that right? And now, with those seven letters to the seven churches, what's the last church? Laodicea. Laodicea. Now, how many times have you heard, we're in that church of Laodicea? Why do you say that? If you look at those seven letters to the seven churches, they were literal churches. The letters were meant for that specific church at that time period, but it had a much broader meaning as well. They covered time periods all the way to the end of this world. And so, if you're living at the end of the world, what church would you be living under? Why? Because that's the last church, right? So that's the seventh church. Is there an eighth? So the church of Laodicea, God has some very strong counsel for it because it perceives itself one way and God sees it a totally different way. Right? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Kyle, you got that? Galatians chapter 6, or have you given up on me? Galatians chapter 6. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. Galatians 6, verses 14 and 15. But God forbid that I should boast except where? In the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and what? I, I to the world. Was Paul a successful Christian? Yeah. Was Paul a successful worker for Jesus Christ? Yeah. Was Paul truly converted? Absolutely. If Paul was to come and look at the church today, would he pat us on the back and say, good job, brothers and sisters? Do you know what our problem is? It's found here in his verse. Paul's success was based on the fact that he was crucified to the world and the world was crucified to him. We're not crucified to the world and the world definitely isn't crucified to us. That, brothers and sisters, is why Jesus has to come. That, brothers and sisters, is why we're wandering in the wilderness. And that, brothers and sisters, is our greatest need to be able to see what our true condition is. We look and we've heard the Laodicean in church that, you know, we're neither hot, we're not cold, we're lukewarm, we're blind, we're wretched, we're poor, we're naked. But unless you internalize that and realize it's talking to you, talking to you personally, that you have to be able to see your condition the way God sees it. And when you're able to see yourself as God sees you, then you will have no other option but to fall to your knees, embrace the cross, and realize the power that's contained there. Amen.
So we read Galatians 6.14. I'll read it again. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But what avails something? A new, a new creation. What does that mean? You find this phrase here, but you also find Paul writing about this in other places. The old has passed, the new has come. You are a new creation, right? That old man, what does he call it? The old man of what? The old man of sin is dead. How did that old man die? Turn to Galatians chapter 2. Let's look at verse what, Ricky? 20. One of his favorite verses. Galatians 2.20. This, brothers and sisters, is what we need as individual believers in Jesus Christ. Can you read that for me, please? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, I can't speak for you. I can't speak about your experience. I can only tell you my experience and what God does with me. And I can tell you that for my own experience, this is my greatest need, to understand what it means to be crucified with Christ. Not just once a week when I come to church that I'm looking for you guys. But to be crucified with Christ when I'm out there in the world. So that the world will be crucified to me and I will be crucified to the world. So that the world will not see me but will see Christ living in me. I am crucified with Christ and yet I live. But it's no longer I who live but it's Christ who lives in me. Christ living in me, the power of the cross. How to overcome selfishness. How to have a new heart and be truly converted. How do you deal with people you just don't like? Do you like everybody? Huh? Ray, do you like everybody? No. Come on, bro. Yeah. No, only Samuel Clemens liked everybody. I never met a man he didn't like. So listen. We live in a world that has waxed wicked and the hearts of the people have grown cold their ears have grown dull and yet we are supposed to be Christ to this world now when I run into situations where one person okay I can deal with it two people I can deal with it three people I can deal with it but when you got four or five six and you're never in this this situation that situation that situation and you're called be crucified with Christ. What I find is I can take myself off that cross. And it's no longer Christ living in me. It's the devil living in me. And I don't want that anymore. But what I'm learning and what I'm wanting as a deer pants for water, this is what I'm thirsty for. And that is to truly be crucified with Christ. That Christ can live in me. That he can pour his spirit out in me. That this temple would be a fit reservoir and dwelling place for God Almighty. I can't do it myself. And it's a good thing. You understand that? You can't do it yourself. And that's a good thing. Why? Because it puts your focus on Christ and it puts your faith in Him. If it was Christ plus me, 